Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Pro Wrestling Inside and Out. Today, we have a very special guest, Les Thatcher. A lot of you know him as on television training people and, and uh, being mean to some people, too, I think, so with the case. But he's going to be talking, hopefully not being mean tonight or today, whenever you may be watching this. Uh, but we're going to talk to him. Les, welcome to Pro Wrestling Inside and Out. Thank you, Rodney. Always a pleasure to hang out with you and, and chat. Uh, I, I'm not a second generation person in wrestling, but obviously you are. So uh, you've, you're more deeply entwined than I am. <laughs> well, a lot of it, I was watching you. So it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big deal, and it's an honor to have you here. Honor to have Thank you here. You. Let's, let's, let's start way back when you're just a little kid watching wrestling on TV. Tell us about that. All right. Yeah, well... Actually, the first time I saw wrestling on television, it was on a neighbor's TV. We didn't have one. And uh, so a little black and white 10 inch. And we're going to go over to the Benzing's house and watch wrestling. Uh, wrestling. <laughs> I wasn't aware. But after sitting in the front of that little 10 inch black and white screen, I was aware. It hooked me right away. Just, I don't know, the, the personalities, the... Uh, you know, the showmanship, the whole night. We had Ivan Rasputin, the Russian bear, right? And uh, Hans Schnabel and uh, Lord Blairs and, and just Don Eagle, the Indian, right? And so I got hooked. And the good thing was my mom and dad enjoyed it as well. So we got a TV. We're watching home. We started going to the matches live. And uh, I got hooked. You know, uh, like now, uh, currently, uh, there's tell, uh, wrestling almost every night on TV, right? Uh, it was the same way back then. Uh, Cincinnati, WLWT in Cincinnati, WLWD in Dayton, uh, Chicago, Marigold, Marigold Arena, uh, St. Nick's Arena in New York, Hollywood Legion Stadium in LA, and Texas style wrestling, right? It was all, man. Were they, were they different uh, approaches, each each one different, or they were similar, or were they different? Uh, similar, but different talents, you know. Sure. But the good thing, at, we're uh, living in Cincinnati, Ohio. Al Heff, based out of Columbus, was one of the biggest promoters in the country at that time. He promoted Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, and Indiana. And from talking to the guys from that era, uh, he had on his payroll – probably 70, 75 guys, and they were running two and three towns every night, you know. And so, and these guys from television ended up working for Haft at some point, so all these people are coming through uh, Cincinnati Music Hall, and we get to watch them, right? I fell in love with Buddy Rogers. That was my, I wanted to be Buddy Rogers. And, of course, once I got smart to this, I couldn't have picked a better role model if I'd have been smart back then, right? Right. The best ever, ever. And uh, so that hooked me. I wanted to be a wrestler. Uh, no high school. It was no wrestling in high school. At Greater Cincinnati Public High School had no late, you know. So there was a YMCA and bus ride uh, from me and a buddy of mine go over there. And there, it's organ, but it's not really organized, right? This guy is kind of knows what he's doing, but uh, it's not a team. Then there's the YMCA downtown, which is also. So I never really got as much as I wanted to. You know, I got some instruction. I learned a little bit. And my friend and I who go with me, uh, we get down and, you know, do what we thought we would see and everything. Here's the crazy thing. In front of our TV at home, uh, my, my mother had this pillow that was damn near as tall as me, right, when I was standing up. And I would get down in front of the TV where we watching wrestling. And if this guy is so-and-so had a headlock, not only would I get a headlock on the pillow, but I'd position my legs. I'm teaching myself to work. Sure. <laughs> and don't sure. even know it, right? But that's true. It, it, it Honestly, you know, looking back at it, that helped me a little bit. But sure. because I always had an eye for detail, and no matter, you know, if I'm playing Cowboys, uh, well, that's gun's got to go here, you know, and everything's got to be perfect, just like saw in the movies. And so, you know, but yeah, I was hooked. 
but of course it was a closed shop and, and uh, you talk to the referees at the matches and you talk, you know, well, kid, you know, you need to get a background and, but nobody told you where to do all these things. Right. I even, uh, when I was 17, a friend of mine rode with me, went up to Reynoldsburg, Ohio, which is where Al Hafs, Hafs Acre and his offices were at the time, just outside of Columbus. And I went in, I, you know, not being any smarter than a 17 year old kid is going to be. I want to be a professional wrestler. I weighed about 170, 75 pounds. And so Frankie Talibur, who I'd seen wrestle, comes out to talk to me. He was the booker. Of course, I he didn't tell me that. And I didn't wouldn't have known what a booker was anyway. And so uh, he's like, oh, you got to put on some size. You got, you know, this and that. Get some experience. Everybody's, you need experience. Okay. Where do I get it? Do I buy it? Can I order it from Sears and Roebuck or what? I, and, you know, looking back, if Talibur had said, well, we can train you. He actually, by not saying that, saved my life, I would say, because the guys I would have had to work out with that were on the, in a half promotion at that time would be Carl Gotch, Bill Miller, <laughs> Joe Scarfello, <laughs> Bob Geigel, every damn shooter in the business, right? So... I might have been a lot taller, but I'm not sure I'd have been any healthier. So anyway, uh, reading Wrestling Review magazine, I saw this article. Tony Santos in Boston, a wrestling promoter, giving young men a chance. Uh, young athletes that want to pursue a wrestling career. You can do it here in Boston at Santos' gym. Uh, $300 for six months. So I wrote him a letter, realized for those listening, there's no internet, no cell phones and so forth. I wrote him a letter and they sent me back a trifold, you know, uh, and actually, if you'd like to see it, I've got it here. Well, yes. Hold it up. Put it up there. I'll, I'll zoom in on you here. Let me, let me see where it's at here. Uh, but this is the actual trifold that Santos Sent back to me. Where are we at there? Can you see it? Right, just put it right in front of your face. Right in front of my face. Okay. Yeah. Now that, there you are. Now, what does your notes say on there? Well, those are his notes, and they say um, there are rooms, and uh, they can be had for between eight and ten dollars a week. Uh, there is work, plenty of jobs. We don't supply work and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And thank you, Mr. Santos. Uh, inside, uh, Jesse James, Alma Mills, the lady you see there, she made my jackets. She cut our hair. She wrestled bears, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she worked so seriously. So yeah. Bring it up she, just a little bit higher there for us right there. We'll check it out. Got it. Because there, there's the wrestling ring. Yeah, just a little bit higher there. There we go. We've got the wrestling ring. There she is. Yeah. Looks like possibly a shower. Is that the shower? Yeah, well, that's, uh, let me see. That's the uh, massage and tanning. So oh, you and get there, yeah, there is, yeah. Massage and tanning for the yeah, in this 1960, talk about high class. Sure. So, it and wasn't what, what high would, class, what, so, by the way. So $300, 1960, what would that be today, you think? Wow. Well, I tell you, when I sold HWA in 2001, I was getting $4,000 for six months. So yeah. Was, so that's made Santos 300 for six months, right? Sure. And uh, so, yeah. So anyway, I got on a Greyhound bus, February 1960, and went off on my adventure to Boston. And uh, so it all started. Got a rooming house and uh, to condense the first couple of weeks, they hand me my ass every night. <laughs> Now, well, this is you know, in the training, right? This is in yeah. the training uh, in the training facility. Yeah, right. Yeah, not on the street. They didn't beat me up on the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, seriously. Uh, I was, you know, 
I was an athlete from the time I was in the organized sports from the time I was seven year old, baseball, football, basketball, so forth and so on. And so I'm an, I'm a jock, right? 19 years old. Okay. Wrong. <laughs> I mean, they didn't really set out to hurt me, but they let you know that at any time here, if I want to break that arm, right? It's just sure. a matter of doing it. And uh, it was, it was tough. To, but the point was, they weren't going to smarten you up until they were sure you were going to stick around, you know? Now you so, do, did you go to the house shows to observe as well, or was it yes. just strictly inside? No, uh, I, well, uh, you know who, uh, Gene Dundee is. Yes. Bro. Okay. Yes. That's to That's Gene Santos, who was Tony's son, the oldest son. <laughs> and he worked in the gym too. Now here's the crazy thing. He was smart, right, and helped with the training, but he had never himself wrestled in front of a live crowd. So a year, almost a year later, I had his first match in front of a live crowd. But anyway, I trained with Jim, and he hauled the ring, you know, to the places that didn't have one permanently. And so I'd ride with him, uh, set the ring up, get in the ring, work out a while, take a shower, Go out, get some D, come back, watch the matches, tear the ring down, take it back to Boston. You know, the cycle continues. <laughs> That's the way it was. We trained four, sometimes five times a week. And so on uh, July 1st, or July 4th, excuse me, 1960, um, Tony's, one of Tony's younger sons came over to my rooming house, just, which is just across uh, the street from the gym, and said, Dad wants to see you. My first thought was, oh, I'm in trouble because it's early in the morning, right? It's 9, 10 o'clock. What's that old man want to see before this, today? We're not training anyway. So I go over and I, I sit down, you know. Well, you know, he said, you've trained hard and this and this and this and this. Today's your day. You're going to have your first match. You've got your trunks. You've got your jacket. Alma, the lady I showed you a picture, she made jackets. Great seamstress. Anyway. Had my boots the whole nine yards. Go back, pack your bag, come back. So I did. And he said, you know how you guys practiced holes and everything in your training? Now, let me explain. How did I learn to work without being told it was a work? Well, they would tell us uh, one, with one of the other trainees, you guys go through the holes, do the switches, do the takedowns. But since you're not getting paid, there's not going to be a winner. I, we don't want you to hurt each other. So just put the hold on, but don't apply pressure. So they were teaching us to work without telling us it was a work basically. Right. So, uh, he, you know, he said, you know how you used to train and you know, without, I said, yes, sir. Well, that's what you're going to do today. Now he didn't tell me I'd be doing that the rest of my life, but today, right. We're just, just taking a little bit at a time. <laughs> so there were three other guys. It was a spot show at the blue Hills, Maine, fairgrounds racetrack and uh bull montana who i had bought tickets to watch as a kid uh cowboy ronnie hill and joe sasso sasso had played football at boston college and he had just been in the business a couple years himself and they picked me up at the gym so i'm not sure of the mileage i'm going to say a couple hundred miles anyway between boston and blue hills maine and the rest of my education takes place in that car right and them trying, you know, this and, and relax me, obviously, of course. So I worked twice the first day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, back then, well, spot shows, four yeah. wrestlers. You know, when you tell kids today, we had four wrestlers, we did three matches, and we had a two and a half hour show. They'll look at you like you must be nuts. Yeah, they Why? will. <laughs> well, you know, Ronnie Hill and I opened a show uh, in Blue Hills. Then Sasso and Bull Montana had the second match. Then Sasso and I came back in the tag against Ronnie and Bull. And that was my education. And my first shower was through a garden hose behind the racetrack tower from a damn spring. Boy, and it there was colder go. then. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, and, and, and think about it. Two-hour show, three matches. Yes, sir. Take a look at that. 
So I got plenty of room to try to do. That's right. Try try to do that one night. Three matches, two and a half hours nowadays. Well, you know, when I started my company in Cincinnati, HWA, uh, we do two and a half hour shows with five matches. And a lot of you, how do you do that? I said, you learn to work. That's how you do it. Exactly. <laughs> but so, anyway, yeah, so that was the way it started. And uh, wow. You know, I remember it. I don't remember. I don't think I was nervous, Rodney. Uh, but I mean, I, I kind of floated through it. I, I wasn't on drugs, but I'm not sure I could. Well, everybody that. that was in the ring with you that say you're familiar with already. Oh, you, there yeah. was nobody knew it was everybody that, that you had already seen been. before. Right. Yeah. Right. No. Uh, the one thing I do remember in the tag match, Bull Montana put a headlock on me and it was so loose. And I was, you know, obviously a bit nervous. This is the first time I've been in a ring with him. Just a guy when I was like 9, 10, 11 years old. He used to buy tickets to see. I was so, almost walked out of the headlock. That was how, <laughs> how nice and loose it was, right? And he snugged up. He said, stay here, kid. Okay. <laughs> Got it. But that was, as far as I know, the only real close to a mistake that, you know, I made in that first one. Not, not that I went out there and, and tore the house down, but it was. You know, well, like you made it through. I mean, you made it through, and nobody stretched you in the process. So exactly, you, you lived. You lived. That's the that's the main thing. And so, I lived. <laughs> that's right. So so now you've had your first match. Yeah. When has it become time to say, okay, wrestling is my profession. This is my only job. Wow. Actually, that came. What that was nineteen sixty, probably. Actually, 66. And the reason I say that, my second love, and had I have not ever pursued wrestling, it would have been drag racing. I was driving, <laughs> I was driving, I was driving race cars when I was 15 years old, before I even had driver's license driving on the street. My my dad enjoyed it. And so we had, you know, we built drag cars. And so once I came back to Ohio, uh well, I won't say permanently, but once I didn't, I knew I wasn't going back to the Boston territory anymore. Uh, we got back into racing and wrestling. But the point was, rest, uh, racing obviously is all good weather sport, right? So I could go on the road and go wherever I want, territory, Kansas City, Charlotte, whatever, as long as it wasn't race season, right? But then I'd come home, dad and I'd get the car ready. And we did well, you know, we had some, uh, we ran the nationals and uh, we won some regional, you know, titles and stuff. Prop maybe if we'd have gotten some big sponsors, we had some sponsors, but it never got to where, you know, it was make it full time for you. I might've continued, but anyway, so I'll tell you what, a lot of summers when I was working for Barnett or the uh, Sheik later in, in Detroit, uh, I might wrestle, I don't know, somewhere in Indiana or Michigan or something on Saturday night, drive virtually all night to get home, get a couple hours sleep in my bed. My dad's loading the race car up and it ready. I go out and crawl in the back of the race car and sleep on the way to the track strip. Right? <laughs> and here you are wore out and you're out driving a car. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> only, only a quarter of a mile at a time. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, uh, and it, I realized we had plateaued in, in the racing department. So uh, in 66, uh, I had been in Arizona for a while, came back into, into Ohio, and uh, Roger Kirby called me from Atlanta. He and Dennis Hall were down there. And we had made friends. They, they're both Indiana boys, and we had met while we were working for Barnett and became friends. Hey, why don't you come down here? I'd love to, you know? And so a few weeks later, my phone rings. Kirby says, we're in the Atlanta office. Leo Garibaldi wants to talk to you. Leo and Gino Garibaldi, my God. I, I was a big fan, right, of them too. And, and Leo and I became buddies, and he became a hell of a mentor to me. So anyway, you know, he said, do you want to come to Atlanta? Sure. Okay, they tell me you could, you could work. Can you? I said, well, I hope so. So anyway, that's uh, 
And once I made the run to Atlanta in, in 66, uh, never looked back, uh, got, you know, sold off the race cars and it was wrestling full time from there. Full time. So you get to Atlanta. What's the first thing they have you doing? Doing a job. <laughs> no. Well, actually it was, uh, I moved, Dennis was leaving. He, Dennis was going to Florida down to Tampa. And so I moved in with Kirby and, uh, Leo put us together. That's where we came up with the idea to do the cousins thing with Dennis and Roger and I was in Atlanta. And so that first night that I was there, we were at the old Atlanta auditorium and uh, Leo comes around and said, you guys are working with this tag team, but I'm going to make my top heel team. And uh, he said to me, he said, look, I don't want you to think I'm going to start beating you from the get go. But these guys, I've got to get over. They're going to be my top heel team for a long run. So I need you and Roger to do the job tonight. Okay, no problem. Leo, as you know, refereed.